Welcome back. We are continuing uh, in this video and the next with the study of Martin Luther that we began in the last two videos and in the last set of PowerPoints. Uh, once again, I want to remind you that uh, with this set of PowerPoints, uh, the notes that you have, there will be uh, two videos uh, to cover those. Again, continuing uh, the story of the life of Martin Luther and the beginning of the Reformation and something of Luther's uh, theology, again, will be the focus uh, when we uh, get a little bit further on uh, with this. So let's go ahead and return to our study of Martin Luther, and we'll see that after the Diet of Worms, uh, Luther's uh, life, we said, was uh, in danger. He was a condemned and wanted man. And so uh, some friends of his... Uh, uh, instead of uh, conducting him back home to Wittenberg, uh, kidnapped him, uh, essentially, and uh, took him, for his own safety, to the uh, Wartburg Castle in uh, Germany. Uh, in May 1521, the Roman Emperor Charles V ordered that Luther's writings be burned. We saw that. <clears throat> and so on the way home from Worms, he was abducted by friends, took him to the Wartburg Castle, where he remained in hiding for nearly a year. Uh, he wasn't uh, just uh, biding time there. He spent uh, his time writing pamphlets, more writing, attacking uh, Catholic practices, and uh, in particular, importantly, he began his uh, translation of the German Bible. Whether it was at the Wartburg Castle or later, uh, it's important that somewhere during these years, uh, he had what he called later, or what uh, historians and biographers of Luther call his tower experience. His tower experience is called that because it was a major theological breakthrough that again is associated in his own writings with the tower, the exact tower that with it is, uh, again, as I say, remains somewhat unclear. Uh, it's because of a statement that his, that it took place in the tower of the Augustinian monastery, but there was more than one of those. In any case, although scholars are still divided on the dating, many today accept Luther's own statement that it did not occur until 1518, and uh, that is because it was noted in a sermon uh, in 1518 on uh, two kinds of righteousness. Don't forget that the nailing of the 95 Theses happened in October of 1517, and so uh, he himself is dating this to sometime in 1519. Others put it even later. Uh, Luther spent his days poring over the scriptures until one moment his whole perspective in life changed. Again, it, it's often referred to as though it came in one blinding uh, flash of light, sort of like Paul's experience on uh, the Apostle Paul's experience on the road to Damascus. Uh, Luther himself said it happened in 1519 in, in another place, uh, although it's often dated uh, earlier than this. Many Luther scholars believe that this later recollection uh, indicates that Luther gradually progressed in his understanding of justification, moving from the view of justification as a process initiated by God in which the sinner cooperated to the belief that it was a forensic act, that, that is, a, a declaration, a legal declaration, that's what forensic act means, a legal declaration, in which Christ's righteousness is imputed to the sinner. The word imputed means what Paul says in, in the book of Romans, right? we are reckoned as righteousness, considered as righteousness, or if you have sort of a bookkeeping metaphor, it was put to uh, the account of the sinner, uh, sort of like there was a debt, but now something is put to the account, uh, imputed uh, to the account, credited to the account of the sinner. Uh, and that's how Christ's righteousness becomes ours. It's imputed. It's credited. Rather than contributing to our justification, good works are the result of our justification and the response of one who has been justified. So our righteousness isn't something that's earned by works, it's something that's credited to us, uh, given to us by God's declaration, uh, by our faith in Christ. In any case, it seems like uh, 
Augustine's conversion in the Milanese garden, which we dealt with earlier. Luther's tower experience was merely the climactic moment in a gradual process that developed over several years. Luther finally understood the passage in Romans that had tormented him before, Romans 1.17. And he came to realize that no matter how much he did, he would never put to rest the guilt that tormented him. Only God could do that. In this tower experience, uh, Luther discovers uh, the real meaning of the righteousness of God. It's, uh, in essence, it's, it's here uh, that Luther discovers the gospel. Uh, as it's, uh, it came during his scholarly labors as a doctor in Biblia, and that is in preaching scripture, as we've seen. And the pivotal text, pivotal text is Romans 1.17 which reads, for in it, that it there is the gospel in context, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, but the righteous one will live by faith, which, by the way, is a quotation from uh, the Old Testament prophet Habakkuk. Here's his words. At last, as I meditated day and night on the, revelation, on the relation of the words, the righteousness of God is revealed in it, as it is written, the righteous person shall live by faith. Uh, again, Romans 1, 17. Luther says, I began to understand that the righteousness of God as that by which the righteous person lives by the gift of God. And that this sentence, the righteousness of God is revealed to refer to a passive righteousness by which the merciful God justifies us by faith. As it is written, the righteous person lives by faith. This immediately made me feel as though I had been born again, and as though I had entered in the open gates into paradise itself. From that moment, I saw the whole face of Scripture in a new light. And now, where I had once hated the phrase, the righteousness of God, I began to love and extol it as the sweetest of phrases, so that the passage, this passage in Paul became the very gate of paradise to me, as it has to many others after Luther. To use Luther's words, it is a sweet exchange between Christ and the sinner. Uh, again, his own words. Therefore, my dear brother, learn Christ and him crucified. Learn to pray to him, despairing of yourself, saying, Thou, Lord Jesus, art my righteousness, and I am thy sin. Thou hast taken on thyself what, what thou wast not, and hast given to me what I am not. Uh, when Luther says there that... Uh, Christ, the Lord Jesus, he says uh, uh, that he is uh, our sin, that we take, he takes our sin, that means that our sin is imputed to him, reckoned to him when he died on the cross. So it's an imputation of our sin to Christ and an imputation of Christ's righteousness to us. Uh, that essentially is the gospel. For Luther, the sal salvation was anchored in the internal, inscrutable purpose of God. Luther anticipated the human-centeredness of later Protestant piety and guarded against it by insisting that God's grace comes from outside ourselves. Faith is not a human possibility. Faith is not something that God expects from us. It is a gift given to us, and by that, then, we have imputed to us, I say again, the righteousness of God. Faith is not a dimension of religious personality. It is a radical and free gift from God. This is the reason why our theology is certain, Luther said. It snatches us away from ourselves and places us uh, outside ourselves so that we do not depend on our own strength, conscience, experience, person, or works, but depend on that which is outside ourselves, that is, on the promise and truth of God which we, uh, which cannot deceive cannot deceive us, he means. As a result, Luther exchanges anger toward God for love for God. Again, I extol the sweetest word with a love as great as the hatred with which I had before hated the word righteousness of God. So Luther moved from viewing righteous as active, something we had to achieve or he had to achieve, to something passive, something Christ has achieved on his behalf or had achieved on his behalf and has achieved on our behalf, for that matter. 
apprehended not by our works or our merits, but by faith alone. The Reformation plank of sola fide, faith alone, was born when Luther was born again. In 1522, Luther returned to Wittenberg to deal with disorders that had broken out in his absence, and he remained there the rest of his life. Throughout his life, Luther maintained an overwhelming workload, writing, teaching, organizing the new church, and providing overall leadership for the German Reformation. During this time, uh, some other changes for Luther. Second great event of 1525 was his marriage to Katharina, Katharine von Bora, uh, also known as, he referred to as My Lord Katie, and he also referred to as his chain. That's not very nice as a husband, but nevertheless, I guess he meant it in a jest. She was one of a group of Cistercian nuns who had escaped from the cloister in uh, Nubchen in 1523. They arrived in Wittenberg in April of that year. Luther had arranged for these nuns to be married off, but Katie proved something of a problem. Uh, initially, she had been placed in the household of the artist Lucas Cranach, and if you see some of the pictures uh, here in, in my slides, they are portraits of Luther and others. This one you see there of Katie was painted by Lucas Cranach. After various abortive attempts to marry her off, she expressed her desire to marry either Luther or one of his colleagues. She just didn't want to be married to somebody uh, who just came by. She wanted to marry somebody that she knew and respected. And uh, actually, that turned out to be Luther himself. In 1525, Luther married Katharina von Bora, his former nun. Uh, they had six children together. And the story of Katharina's arrival in Wittenberg is rather amusing. They, uh, they smuggled these nuns uh, out uh, in uh, barrels that uh, were supposed to be full of uh, herring uh, fish. And uh, you can imagine that that would have been a very unpleasant trip uh, for Katharina and her companions. But uh, that was what they needed to do in order to get to the Protestant area of Wittenberg and then find uh, that they could become wives and mothers and have a fulfilling uh, marital life along with their devotion to this new Protestant faith. Uh, it was again in 1525 that Luther agreed to marry her on June 13th, and he married her, and uh, <clears throat> Carl Truman there, who I'm quoting, says, suffice it to say that it appears to have been a very happy and fruitful uh, ar arrangement for both. He died following a stroke at Eisleben, the town of his birth, and we said that uh, a while back, uh, on February the 18th, 1546. Luther had undertaken uh, a number of trips in these years in order to uh, deal with disputes or uh, controversies that developed between uh, Lutherans, and in this instance, between two Lutheran nobles. Uh, he shouldn't have taken the trip, but uh, he felt obligated. He was basically what we would call a workaholic. But he did, and he fell ill, and he was buried back in Wittenberg in the castle church. And if you visit Wittenberg today and you go to the castle church, which is pictured there, uh, you will be able to go in and see this very uh, bronze uh, plaque. And Luther is buried beneath that uh, as a testimony to his influence on that church and on the Reformation. Well, again, we're going to stop this particular video. Uh, Keep these uh, PowerPoint slides, these outlines, uh, before you because we'll pick it up in the very next video uh, where we'll continue again our account. And we'll be getting into next the, the theology of Luther and uh, some of his writings.